So as the 1800s progress, and frankly, when the Civil War comes to an end, the concept of capitalism and industry, all right, these dueling ideas are going to collide headfirst in the United States. So to understand how this built up, we first are going to examine the varying ideologies of capitalism. So in 1859, Biologist Charles Darwin published on the origin of the species, which was the culmination of his time studying in the Galapagos Islands. This is the seminal text in which the scientific theory of evolution was first made public, and the concept of survival of the fittest became popular ideology. Englishman Herbert Spencer applied this scientific idea to the realm of sociology with what became known as social Darwinism. So Spencer is the guy that you see here. And essentially, social Darwinism means that ever since mankind walked the earth, specific traits were passed down to their offspring. The best and brightest would advance higher in life, while the rest got left behind. And this idea applied not only to individuals, but also to nations, wherein the belief was that European and North American countries were viewed as the fittest due to their early industrialization. American William Graham Sumner took these ideas a step further, when he actually advocated against welfare of any kind or charity for the poor because he felt that it would invite poverty. Instead, he pushed for pure laissez-faire capitalism. Ideologically, laissez-faire had been emerging as the prevailing ideology relating to American industry during that first half of the 1800s. Essentially, it meant that the federal government was to take no role whatsoever in the economy, because again, laissez-faire is French for hands off. And the decades following the Civil War were as close as the United States ever came to true laissez-faire. Now speaking specifically to an American audience, social Darwinism did help smooth over any arguments as to whether capitalism was moral and if being hyper-rich was viewed as unchristian because religion really mattered in American society. German sociologist Max Weber articulated his thoughts in his 1905 book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. And this was the model to explain these apparent contradictions. Weber argued that the Puritans had produced a religion that was conducive to what he referred to as worldly activity. And the Puritans had reduced business down to a very rational, very scientific process. Weber declared that according to Puritan tradition, prosperity was a sign of future salvation, and those who amassed great wealth were supposed to continue laboring for the purpose of the glory of God, rather than personal gain. Now, in doing so, you're supposed to just limit your life to the religious and economic realms. Everything else is idle and wasteful. You know, thrift, the idea of making do with what you have and being efficient, was also a significant component of Weber's ideology. And tithing also goes hand in hand with it. Tithing would be the process of automatically donating a portion of one's income to a religious institution. And we'll see that numerous people epitomize this ideology, but none more so than the oil tycoon John D. Rockefeller. Now, industrialization occurred in other places, but why the U.S.? You know, why was it that the United States became this bastion of pure capitalism? Prior to the U.S. Civil War, the vast majority of businesses, or what now we might call corporations, produced one product only, or they just provided a singular service. After the war, diversification gained steam, and really the groundwork was laid in a place called Wall Street. Wall Street in New York, and New York had an amazing harbor. Its Dutch roots made it ideal for capitalism to develop. And in the 1790s, as you see depicted on screen, the city's traders began to meet under a buttonwood tree on Wall Street, and they came up with rules about buying bonds and trading shares for companies. Soon, the trading moved from under the buttonwood tree to an indoor facility, Increased traffic along the Erie Canal meant that capital was flowing through the mighty port of New York. The destruction of the second bank in the U.S. simply means that Philadelphia no longer is a rival to New York. 
And this new influx of California gold solidifies New York's status as the financial center of the U.S. And all of these factors make it a growing worldwide financial player. Even though London and Paris were larger, the U.S. was considered developing and had more potential for heavy investors. Wall Street's at the center of it all. And to most Americans, Wall Street was as much of an idea as a physical place. And most of the work that occurred here was the exchange of paper notes and speculation. And most people, even today, didn't quite understand it. So it developed somewhat of a sinister attitude. A financial panic in 1857 gripped Wall Street, but those who were able to weather the storm really came out much better for it. And this is always the case in any type of recession. The Civil War led to a boom in government finance contracts, and that subsequently led to the explosion of business. And the following decades were some of the most prosperous in American history. Humorist and author Mark Twain summarized the nature of unfiltered capitalism and the corruption that he viewed that went hand in hand with it in an 1879 book that he called The Gilded Age, a tale of today. Now, the book itself, not great. He co-authored it with a friend, they divided up the chapters, it was very clunky in terms of the narrative. But it's a simple idea. In the modern era, or what was his modern era, there were a few men who put their own ambitions and self-interests ahead of characteristics like honesty and integrity. Pure capitalism was an outright insult to democracy, although the term in and of itself, the Gilded Age, really simply characterizes a time when the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The picture, the protectors of our industries, was drawn in 1883 for Puck Magazine. And this really symbolizes the perceived inequities of this Gilded Age. So the Gilded Age is simply a nickname for this time frame. This is also a time when the great titans of industry chose to focus on domestic industries rather than the capitalists of Europe who sought their fortunes in Africa and Asia. Geographically, the American market was diverse, so there are multiple industries to invest in. Demographically, the population went from 40 million in 1870 to 76 million in 1900. So there's a large workforce that can fuel these industries. Politically, even though there's many states, the U.S. is one nation. And commerce that went in between states isn't subject to additional taxes or duties. The Union victory in the Civil War ensured it would remain that way. And that government and business contracts would be upheld as sacred so businesses would be able to prosper. Now the first example of a true capitalist in American history is Cornelius Vanderbilt. Now, even though he's born into modest circumstances in Staten Island in 1794, you know, so this guy is born during Washington's presidency, he ended up dying in 1877 as the richest man in the nation. He got a start in transportation by ferrying passengers across the Hudson River and along New York Harbor in his sailboat at age 16. But by that time, Robert Fulton had patented the steamboat. So Vanderbilt went to work for a man named Thomas Gibbons, whose steamboat taxi service operated out of New Jersey and crossed the Hudson River. So the fact that he's conducting business across state lines and it seems to intrude on a monopoly that New York had granted to another service, gets Gibbons in trouble. And this led to the landmark Supreme Court ruling, Gibbons versus Ogden, where the court ruled that only Congress could regulate interstate commerce. Vanderbilt understood exactly what the ruling meant. So he began building his own fleet, and he either crowded out or bought out his competitors. Even started a steamboat service that would transport Easterners to the Atlantic side of the Isthmus of Panama. And they would disembark, go to the Pacific side, and one of his boats would continue the journey to the California coast. So even he is taking advantage of the gold rush. By this point, Vanderbilt is referred to as the Commodore because of his previous experiences as a steamboat captain. And these new railroads posed a threat to his steamboat empire. Because of this, Vanderbilt's obviously not a huge fan of it, but he began to see the writing on the wall because rail technology got better and better, 
and the railroads began to steal water traffic away from the steamboats. The Erie Railroad actually started taking away traffic from the Erie Canal less than a decade after the canal had even opened. You know, most individuals saw stock in railroads as just something to buy and sell. But Vanderbilt viewed them as an investment that you would buy, hold, and then use the dividends to buy more shares. Vanderbilt ended up controlling the vast majority of rail lines in New York City, and he was viewed very favorably there because he made the Harlem Line extremely efficient. Then he controlled the railroads in New York State, and then he expanded to the East Coast as a whole. Now, he's the first colossus of American industry, and his actions form a template for others to follow. He became proficient in one aspect of business, steamboat captain and then an operator of a steamboat business. He took immediate action when a new opportunity presented itself, in this case, railroads. He made the process as efficient and cost-effective as possible. He held on to his shares and used the dividends to purchase more shares and increase his wealth. And when control of the industry is obtained, because he essentially controlled the East Coast Railroads, when he obtained that control, he used the money for collective good. Cornelius Vanderbilt endowed the initial $1 million for the construction of Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. He founded it in 1873 because he hoped that it could be used to help the United States heal from the divisive Civil War. And others would follow his example. So although he dies 1877, a little over a decade after the Civil War, there certainly will be others who take up his mantle and follow his example into capitalist America.